Global from Asia, episode 261. We're heading into India. Welcome to the Global from Asia podcast, where the daunting process of running an international business is broken down into straight up actionable advice. And now your host, Michael Michelini. All right. Thank you, everybody, for choosing to download and stream this podcast. It is uh, an honor that you choose to use your precious time. Time is the most valuable asset. We're slowly dying. Every second it goes by, we are dying. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit morbid. But it makes you realize life is short, you know. Well, there was some 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 article I read. Do you re most people don't remember past the third generation, past past your grandparents? So once grandparent age is gone, at least in the past. But then again, with Facebook and social media, I'll be watching videos of generations of old people. I guess maybe it'll be different now. But we gotta make the most of our moment. We are here living for today. Maybe I'm reading too many self help books. I do read self help books. Does that mean I'm crazy? Anyways, 261 shows here at Global From Asia. We're grinding away. I'm heading back into the mainland China, as well as Hong Kong, or is that the same thing? I don't know anymore. But I am heading into Hong Kong First Rise Conference. I will be while this show is going online. Also, I hope to wish happy birthday to Brent Deverman, listener. I think he still listens to the show. I know he used to listen. I don't know if maybe you can let me know if he heard me shout out today. The listeners come and go, I hope, and I hope they keep coming. Phil Suslow, thanks, Phil. This guy was crazy. He's uh, he's also an investor at Sisitano and Par Living, and an uh, amazing guy. Comes from many of our events. Phil is so great and supportive of what we're doing here. He also just had a birthday, and he also went into Iraq. I don't know. Maybe we'll finally one day maybe get him on the show to share some of his amazing knowledge and experiences. This guys living on the edge, living on the edge for sure. Lorenzo, I know her. Buddy Lorenzo is listening to the show. Enjoyed the last one with Tommy and some of my China experiences. I think today at the blah, blah, blah. We're talking about India today. It's a great one with Megla. She's been very active in the community over the years in the cross-border in the Amazon and seller communities. She's making some moves in her personal life and also adjusting to this trade war stuff. So thought it would be a good time to get her on the show talking about India sourcing. And actually, I, I did buy from India many, many, many years ago in my previous lifetime, my previous business. I can talk about that in a blah, blah, blah section after this amazing interview. If some of you like to stick around, I'll share some funny stories and fun stuff with that India experience to add in after. But today, we got Megala on the show, and she's also helping organize. She's a uh, person behind the scenes well uh, in front of the scenes too at the global sources summit in hong kong that happens every trade show season and will be happening uh of course this october she's also got a new venture she'll be sharing about with india taking people out to india she's asked me about thailand sourcing here it's it definitely seems like people she's getting more people contacting her about hedging outside of China. You know, I'm actually doing a consulting project in China for a factory. I think the factories are starting to realize they are, um, you know, they are under threat with this trade war. I know the G20 summit, Trump and Xi were chatting and giving some more time to it, but business owners can't keep sitting around and waiting. I think we're getting more and more people looking for plan B. If you're on our GFA newsletter, you saw me Talk about the Bloomberg article I was quoted in about Thailand sourcing. We've got some interesting people who are contacting us about that. We're trying to help help people find other sources. And then we're talking about India today. I think get your notebook out or if you're driving or riding. We do have a full transcript. We invest a lot of money in this show, in the production. We have a full transcription, usually online, as soon as the show goes online. So it's like thousands of words of text on the show notes, globalfromasia.com slash episode 261. Let's tune in now to Megla. So people have been asking me how am I doing these small shipments from EWU Market and making my payments at an affordable rate. And I'm happy to say I use one of our sponsors, goremit.hk, cross-border payment company from Hong Kong banks to other places in Asia. Of course, China, Philippines, Vietnam, other places, 
definitely check them out. They've been supporting the show for many years now, and they will do a course-free account setup with the KYC fun stuff, and then just pay a percentage of the transaction between uh, between borders. Better rates than most bank transfers. Check them out today at www.goremit.hk. We also have a review about them with a video I did at our clubmasia.com slash reviews slash go remit. Check it out. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning to our Global from Asia podcast. We have a special guest, a budding entrepreneur and business developer, connector, like I would say similar to like what I'm doing, Megla Bardwatch. How are you? Hi, Michael. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me here. Sure, sure. It's great to have you. You know, we've we've uh, been always chatting on Facebook and other mediums, and uh, there's like, exciting times happening for you personally, as well as I think just the global trends of trade is changing too. So I think it's about time we get you on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Very exciting times. And, you know, as you mentioned, I've also started my own venture. So I'm super excited about that, too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're doing quite a few things now. So I think it's best you give people a quick intro of what you're up to these days. Sure, absolutely. So just to give a quick background, um, I've been in the sourcing industry for about 19 years. I've uh, worked for global sources, uh, mostly. I worked in India and the Philippines. I lived in China for about nine years and currently I'm based in Singapore. So um, I've, I've been organizing this e-commerce conference in Hong Kong for global sources called uh, Global Sources Summit. And um, I've been doing this for about three years and that's how I got uh, you know, to know all of these e-commerce sellers and um, all of the different experts uh, in the industry and got a good understanding of what kind of challenges e-commerce sellers face. And recently I've started uh, a couple of my own ventures. One is a sourcing trip to India because there's, there seems to be a lot of interest among e-commerce sellers to source from India. And I'm also starting uh, a community for sellers in Asia called the Asian seller. And so this will, um, you know, we'll have a podcast and uh, we'll organize events and masterminds and conferences for sellers who are based um, in Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, um, India, all of those places. Great, great. Exciting times for sure. And so there's, you know, we'll touch on a lot of these different things you've mentioned today. And we are, you know, mostly focused on India is sourcing and product sourcing. I think, like you mentioned in your intro, there's more and more interest to buy from India or also just buy it by, you know, having a second supplier or some backup plan B. This, I think it would say the, the trade war. I mean, is that why you would say you're getting more inquiries about India or, you know, what's, the, what's your insights so far of, you know, what, what you're hearing in the community? Yeah, absolutely. So the trade war has actually, um, you know, generated a lot of interest among sellers uh, to source from India and other alternative markets as well. So, you know, like Vietnam and Thailand. Um, but even other than that, India has been, um, you know, a strong exporter of a lot of different products. And um, there there are certain products that India is quite competitive in and and there are certain advantages of sourcing those products from India, such as um, there are unique designs and unique styles that are not available in other countries. But um, I think you're right. You know, e-commerce sellers are realizing that uh, they shouldn't be putting all of their eggs in one basket. So a lot of them are, um, you know, thinking of maybe a China plus one strategy. I think that's the approach that some sellers are taking. So they're uh, diversifying their sourcing markets and maybe moving some of their sourcing to other countries so that they're not entirely dependent on China. So I think, um, you know, that's what's kind of happening. And that's why India is getting such a lot of interest nowadays. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I decided to, um, to start this uh, trip. And even without the tariffs, you know, I was seeing some sellers trying to differentiate their products in, um, because most e-commerce sellers, of course, source from China and they're sourcing, you know, the similar kinds of products. So there were some people who were 
um, going to India and other countries like Nepal or um, you know Bangladesh and, and doing products that are available from there and they were you know being uh, successful so that's what also interested me and I thought that you know I worked in India I understand the sourcing market over there really well um, I know where the production hubs are so I uh, am a, I'm in a good position to offer advice to people who are interested in sourcing those kinds of products yeah, it's totally true. I I wanted to mention on the show earlier, but yeah, I've I have just a couple of my own experiences buying from India that went pretty well. My first e-commerce business, and yeah, I mean, also sometimes it also depends on the materials. You know, like I think China's definitely the dominant force of injection mold plastic. I think you know, I I was <laughs> buying I was buying met, stainless steel metal from. India, which I think has a more, that's a lot. Of, I think especially China is not good for wood. You know, I think it depends also on the materials. I know other friends that um, import wood from like Brazil, or I've even talked to factories in China that import wood. You know, from other countries, or so it's also also on the different materials people are using is also a factor. But but yeah, I think the trade wars definitely accelerated. Like I would say, but I think it's true. I think costs have been steadily increasing in China. And uh, it's also good to just differentiate from other sellers or, 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 you know, hedge your risks from your factory becoming your competitor in China. So that is something else I would think about. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I mean, you're right. Uh, there are certain materials that India is more competitive in and these are more of the natural materials so like wood or metal uh, cotton jute rattan those kinds of materials whereas China is more competitive in you know man-made materials plastics and polymers and all of those kinds of things definitely so I think you've already been mentioning it but you know I kind of have on these bullet points pros and the cons of India I think you've mm-hmm. kind of already been saying it but maybe we can just List out. Yeah, I think one of the advantages is, uh, you know, the unique products that are found in India. So each state in India has a distinct uh, culture and a distinct history and a distinct type of uh, product that they make. So a lot of the products are actually handcrafted um, and, and they're handmade. And these products can, you know, have a higher perceived value and they can command higher prices and potentially they can be more profitable than uh, mass produced products that you are sourcing from China. So, um, you know, India suppliers also focus a lot on design development. So you'll, you'll find in a lot of the products are very, you know, unique and, uh, you know, they have very attractive and innovative designs. Um, another advantage I see is low MOQs. Like because a lot of these products are handmade, there's more flexibility uh, in terms of the quantity that can be produced by the supplier. And, you know, in China, of course, suppliers are also accepting lower quantities. But, um, um, you know, in many other countries, like we were just talking uh, a bit earlier before we started recording, like Thailand, you were saying they, they want higher quantities. But in mm-hmm. India, I find that a lot of the handcrafted products, you know, they're flexible with the MOQs. Um, you know, maybe certain product categories like apparel, they won't, wouldn't, would not be that flexible. But um, most of the products that e-commerce sellers source, uh, you'll find that you you can source as few as, you know, 50 pieces to test a product. Yeah. Uh, typically, the minimum orders would range from, you know, 200 to 500 pieces, but they are flexible and they're willing to do trial orders. Maybe the price would be slightly higher. But, you know, at least that allows you to test the product. Agree. Think, no. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Another advantage I feel is a language because in India, most people speak English. So communication is smoother and there is no language barrier. In China, um, it can be a challenge communicating with the supplier. Sometimes there are things that get lost in translation. Um, but in India, you'll have less of that issue. Of course, the accents are very different and they vary from, you know, the yeah. north of India to the south of India. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Indian accents are pretty distinct. Yeah. <laughs> They're very distinct, but... <laughs> but it's still, like you said, it, it might be, the accent might, but because especially if you're buying, you're, you know, you're buying from them, it, they don't end up the most, you know, American accent English, but yeah, it's much better than trying to talk to a Chinese factory where most of the factory owners 
don't speak English, usually they're hiring, you know, sales. I I don't know. My wife, my mom says I'm sexist, but usually it's a female. <laughs> usually it's a woman that's in her twenties that's got a business English degree. That's your main contact in a Chinese factory, and then the factory boss is is uh, you know usually male it doesn't have to be male, but you know a, a adult that doesn't speak much English is, is I think most people's experience. So you're kind of communicating. Yeah. If you don't have an English, I mean, a Chinese person on your team, you're usually speaking to that uh, sales representative that's then translating and relaying that to the factory engineering department. So, of course, having the experienced owner or manager that can speak English directly to you is much better than having like an interpreter or sales representative that's in the middle. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, English is the second official language of India because um, there are more than 22 official languages. Each state has its own language and even the script is different. So, you know, I'm from North India and I speak a different language. If I go to the South of India, I do not understand their language. I I cannot read their script. So English is a language that unites all of us and enables us to communicate with each other. (laughs) Interesting. I feel like similar in the Philippines, you know, a lot of, a lot of listeners and myself included work with people in the Philippines too, and they have different dialects and uh, they also have a lot of English and it kind of binds them together. I think Uh, in China too, there is dialects, but they kind of, enforced mandarin you know even but in the south they very much prefer cantonese if they can at least in the people i talk to but, sure. but yeah yeah english you know that's one good thing for me as an american i always joke I'd, i'm not so strong in my languages but luckily uh you know most people you know have english skills so that helps um <laughs> I think it's, or do you have more, oh, go ahead, or the cons, I think, you know, I I know nobody likes to talk about cons, but I think it's fair (laughs) to, you know, weigh both sides. Absolutely. I think it's really important for sellers to be aware of, um, you know, the challenges that they're going to face. And um, I think the one biggest challenge that they're going to face is uh, India has a very limited product uh, range that is available from there. So China practically manufactures each and every product. I mean, you can, you know, get whether it's electronics or jewelry or fashion, you can get every product there. But for India, there are certain product categories that are competitive. So I think that's one limitation that you might find um, when you source from India. The other thing is that logistics and supply chains are not as advanced as they are in China. So, but I, I feel that things have been improving in the last few years because um, the Prime Minister has this initiative called Make in India, and they've been pumping a lot of investment into developing the manufacturing sector and improving the efficiency of ports and, um, you know, the infrastructure and all is being improved. So I, I am seeing some changes and, um, you know, their, their shipments, for example, are processed faster at the ports, uh, things like that. But of course, it's not as developed as uh, it is in China. And another thing that I found is that suppliers currently are not very familiar with Amazon FBA requirements. So um, I was at this fair in Delhi, which is the capital of India, in February this year, and I was talking to suppliers, and most of them had no idea about Amazon FBA and, you know, how to Mm. ship there. (laughs) Um, So it's going to be, you know... It's, it's probably like what China was maybe four or five years ago. Like a lot of the suppliers had no clue about Amazon FBA, but as more sellers started sourcing, um, you know, suppliers got educated and there were, uh, uh, you know, uh, like specific companies were established uh, to cater to the needs of uh, Amazon FBA suppliers at prep centers and logistics yeah. service providers. So I think that industry in China has evolved over a couple of years. And the same is probably going to happen in India if more e-commerce sellers uh, start sourcing from there as well. You're calling it a con. I call it a, maybe a pro. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on your perspective. But I think sellers, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I think, I think where it's more difficult or, you know, not as developed, I think that's usually where the opportunities would be. You know, if you're going someplace that has – everything already smoothed out, you know, uh, it might be 
not the best place because you're you're like I was saying earlier, the factories are maybe your competitors. I think some sellers I had talked to uh, have had that happen to them already. So you know, I think maybe this might be a good a positive more than a, a negative, depending on. Of course, it'll be more uh, frustrating because you'll have to, you know. I feel like I'm a teacher. I think we're maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's our job, I guess, as a podcast or even with t- people you work with or your suppliers. You have to kind of really teach, but uh, that means there's more, you know, I think more uh, opportunities too. And uh, Yeah, I think you're right. Like the barrier to entry, I think, is higher in India, you know, so to speak. Whereas in China, you can go to, you know, Alibaba, search for a supplier and instantly place orders and they're going to be delivered to Amazon FBA mm-hmm. without you even knowing, yeah. you know, what the shipment process was like or, <laughs> exactly. you know, uh, but whereas in India, you'd have to follow everything very carefully. You'd have to make sure that uh, you've got a freight forwarder that understands how the shipment is going to be you know, sent to different uh, um, Amazon centers, for example. Um, and uh, you know, many of the freight forwarders are also not very familiar with the, with the processes. But um, I think increasingly they're realizing that this is an opportunity for them and you know, they're getting... Um, more e-commerce sellers inquiring uh, about their services. So they are developing those, uh, uh, you know, uh, services for e-commerce sellers. Agreed. And then if I could add one, maybe more con or not for just India, but outside of China, like, you know, I'm here in Thailand and working with some factories and also I well from India though, like, you know, the hardest Harder part is you find good opportunities in all these different places. I guess I like your idea of the China plus one strategy, but you're most likely not going to be able to. Some people like email me or talk to me and they're like, Mike, I want to buy from India and Thailand and China. Can I send it all to Hong Kong or a free trade zone? Well, it sounds great, you know, and it might be possible that, you know, actually adding up the extra shipping costs and all that handling, most likely you're going to send it directly to your and country where you're selling, whether it's US, Europe, Australia, wherever, you know, I don't, I don't think you can really, it sounds like a great idea, you know, like consolidate all these country shipments. Uh, usually if you're buying from a different country, unless you think differently, Megala, I think you're probably going to have to just deal everything there and then send it all directly to where you're going to be selling it or distributing it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So, you know, maybe if you're selling on Amazon.com, then um, send all of the shipments to a prep center in the U.S. where they are consolidated and and then shipped to Amazon. You know, that would make sense. Yeah. So this is stuff we all have to learn if we're, again, this is one of the challenges of, you know, diversifying supplier suppliers. But like we've been saying in the interview, that, that makes also more opportunity. Um, the next is, you know, where I know you have your sourcing trip to India we can talk about. I know people are saying, well, you mentioned Alibaba. Of course, everybody can go. And it's also global sources. You know, where where can people find these suppliers? Like I mentioned before we started recording, I I, I did find on global sources. I think that's one of the advantages is, is there's other non-China suppliers and there's a trade show in Hong Kong where it makes it easier for non-China-based suppliers to get visa entry and to, to visit. Uh, and set up a booth. So I, I, I also have used that. I've met my India supplier in Hong Kong at the Global Sources show many years ago, and I hadn't yet, I still yet to go to India. But of course, I know you have your sourcing trip. I think Global Sources is a good one. Is If you want to dive into both those options or other options, how sure. can people find these other suppliers? Sure. So I think you're right. Um, you uh, People can start with globalsources.com and Alibaba. So there are non-China suppliers. And what, what you need to do is search for a product and then look for the uh, supplier location filter and then filter suppliers by India. So you'll see a list of, uh, you know, all of the India suppliers. And there are quite a few suppliers um, on both of these websites. Um, of course, for the categories that, you know, India is strong in. So for example, uh, home decor or furnishings or garments, apparel, those kinds of categories. Um, so that's one. I would start there, Global Sources and Alibaba. And then there's another website called indiamarch.com that is a local supplier directory. And all of the suppliers on India Mart are actually from India. But the issue with India Mart is that a lot of the suppliers also cater to the domestic market. Um, they do have exporters, 
but you've got to be a little careful when you're choosing suppliers from there and you've got to dig a little deeper to make sure that the suppliers have export experience and they're export focused. Because when you're sourcing from India, then you want to make sure that a supplier has export experience because, uh, you know, India is a huge country and there are 1 billion people and there are a lot of products consumed in the country. So there are tons of manufacturers that, uh, you know, make products, but they're only selling them to the domestic market. But when you're importing, uh, you have to make sure that the suppliers um, are export focused so that you know, they understand the quality standard requirements, the certifications and the design preferences of, of your country. So that's really important when you're uh, buying from India. Um, and then another thing that you can do is in India, there are these export promotion councils for various categories. And these are basically government organizations that are tasked with um, increasing exports in their specific industries. So there's a council for leather garments, for example, or leather products, um, for handicrafts, for metal crafts. Um, so what you can do is search for these councils and then reach out to them and ask for uh, supplier lists. Most of them have uh, directories of their members and they're, you know, they're happy to help importers, although they might be slow to respond because they're you know, government organizations and they're not very efficient. <laughs> yeah, we're on the same page there. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. And then um, trade shows. So um, as you mentioned, you know, some of the trade shows in Hong Kong, uh, even Canton Fair actually has quite a few suppliers from India. And um, the Global Sources Fashion and Lifestyle Show uh, features a lot of Indian suppliers. And then um, suppliers also exhibit at overseas shows in, you know, in the U.S. or Europe uh, if there are, um, you know, exhibitions, the trade exhibitions held in these countries. You can always try to go to, um, you know, a, a local exhibition in the U.S. or Europe, for example, and you'll find suppliers there as well. And then, of course, there are trade shows within India itself that you can visit and we'll probably talk about it. Um, you know, a little later when yeah. we when we talk about the trip as well. But sure. there are a few export focused shows um, that you can visit, and then there are other smaller shows that um, also cater to the domestic market, and but they are more product specific. This is great. Thanks. Thanks for all these insights. I'm even I'm shotting some things down here. And um, the next question, I I think we've covered some of the questions. So I'm kind of skipping around my outline, but. The IP yeah. rights in India, I think, uh, like I have a Chinese wife and I, and sometimes I offend her because I sometimes get a little bit emotional about some Chinese business tactics of not really following IP. You know, even as in the trade war dispute, it seems like with uh, the presidents of the US and China's IP uh, infringement or, or uh, respect to international IP, um, what's the st what would you be your insights about, you know, IP rights within India and internationally. And uh, I don't know if you also want to separate that from <coughs> risks of maybe your product being counterfeited or, uh, you know, these stories you hear a lot about China, you know, you, I don't know if you have some insights. One of maybe, I guess it's two parts. Part one is just, <coughs> you know, respecting or the enforcement of IP in India for international buyers. And then maybe, mm -hmm maybe uh, to any kind of risks, you know, should we be as concerned? A lot of times people are very concerned in China about, you know, exposing everything to these factories. Um, I don't know. If, I guess that's risky anywhere, but maybe we yeah. can just chat about that. Sure. So I feel that in general, um, you know, suppliers have more respect for buyers IP in India. Um, of course, there are bad actors everywhere in in every country. And, uh, you know, you do have some risk, whether you're sourcing from, you know, India, China, Vietnam, anywhere. Um, but I, I feel that, you know, just talking to um, buyers and um, also having worked with suppliers, they do respect buyers IP a lot. And in fact, they themselves, you know, develop a lot of their own products and they're very protective about their own design. And so they value the investment that has gone into developing a product. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was at the fair uh, in February, they wouldn't allow me to take photographs of their products. And they're very strict about this. I mean, I was, um, I had to like ask permission. And, you know, sometimes what they would do is they would put their name card on the product if I, 
if I took oh, a photo. Interesting. And they wouldn't let me video. Like I was walking down the aisle and, you know, just uh, shooting a video of the, of the boots, just walking past them. And this uh, person, he came rushing out of the booth and, you know, he was almost like uh, <laughs> wow. you know, shouting at me. And he was like, madam, what are you doing? You can't video products. Uh, you can't video over mm-hmm. here. So I, so see. I feel that they themselves value, um, you know, the investment and the time and effort. So they're, they're less likely to infringe somebody's, uh, somebody else's IP. They have respect for that. Okay. Um, and then I've also found that if there are more export focused, they tend to be more, you know, professional and they tend to, um, they value your business more than the opportunity of maybe selling your product directly to uh, directly on Amazon or, or, or elsewhere. So I feel that if you have a professional export focused company, um, your IP rights or your, uh, your IP should be safer than it is in China. Okay. Another thing is that the contracts are in English. So whereas in China, the contracts uh, should be bilingual, right? And and, and mm-hmm. contracts. But in, in India, they're all in English because the le- legal proceedings are all in English. So, um, you know, I would still advise people if you, if you have a, a product that you've designed yourself and, you know, you want to protect it, you should sign an agreement uh, before disclosing your design to the supplier, you know, just to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. These are great points. I think one thing uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stick up a little bit for the Chinese businesses a little bit, but the, ex- the reason sometimes they say they're just not as educated about IP or branding and, you know, there's a whole like maybe 30 or 40 years of real business international experience and, Things like that, but it is, I think, still a little bit risky for sellers to um, have one factory, whether it's in China or India or anywhere. I think usually it's also maybe better to try to have a couple of suppliers at least. Like uh, I can go into some long stories, but I met somebody here in Chiang Mai that is getting uh, basically buys all their products from a f- one factory in China, and now that factory is starting to make their own Amazon store and listings and he says at first it wasn't a big deal it's been a couple of years but now they're getting better so mm-hmm. he doesn't know what to do but he's basically kind of stuck buying from them because he's kind of invested all that into one supplier so another way maybe always whether it's india china or anywhere is to try to diversify a little bit if possible i know it's harder especially for small sellers but you know um some ways even if it could be as simple as the pack, potentially packaging or other things, maybe just some ways to try to try to uh, not let them have all of your insights, um, if possible. Um, so I'm looking at my list. I, man, we kind of mentioned it, but I have services in India. I think these are all budding opportunities for people. Uh, you know, there's like I have FBA preps or sourcing QC. These are still under development you think or is there is how would people find these or do they exist these service providers yeah so general import related services such as you know third party inspections service providers for example or freight forwarders and uh you know all of those kinds of uh, services you'd find very easily um the challenge would be to find somebody who is familiar with the e-commerce process specifically for freight forwarding i think uh, that's important um, for quality control, there are, um, you know, a Kima, which is one of, which was Asia inspection previously. So they have offices in India and they offer inspection services at about the same rate as they do in India, uh, sorry, in China. And there are other, you know, in global international uh, inspection companies that have offices in India. So that's one option if you're sourcing directly, you know, from a factory. And then in India, if you're sourcing via an agent, then usually the agent will help you to uh, do the QC as well. Um, Of course, you need to work closely with the agent and make sure that they know all of your uh, product requirements and maybe even give a golden sample to them. But a lot of times the agents themselves manage uh, quality control. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, as far as freight forwarding is concerned, so um, I've actually started a Facebook group for people who are interested in India sourcing. And um, 
what I've done is that I've talked to a few different types of service providers, you know, logistics and QC, and then I've included those um, uh, service providers in the Facebook group so that, uh, you know, in case anyone wants to start sourcing from India, they do have uh, a ready source, uh, you know, for these service providers who, who are familiar with e-commerce requirements. Great, great. Actually, I'm thinking of some people I might have to introduce to you too. Now that I think about it, uh, I could maybe after the show, but they're uh, in our in our network too that uh, that have services, which would be great. Sure. Uh, and the, the another, we're getting towards the end here. It's been great so far, but the in, also it's not just up for buying, right? I mean, India as a domestic market, you kind of hinted towards that with in the show. People, you know are buying there and selling in India. I mean, it's a massive market. Is that something also, of course, we got to focus, you know, as sellers on different markets, but is there also, uh, what would you say in general, Amazon India or just India e-commerce in general is, is any insights? Absolutely. So Amazon India is growing really fast and Amazon is uh, investing a lot of money into, um, you know, into, um, into India and they're focusing on, uh, recruiting a lot of uh, sellers from India to sell locally on Amazon India as well as uh, globally. And so that's one opportunity. And the e-commerce market in India is actually growing really fast, especially in the um, you know second tier cities, second and third tier cities, because um, the penetration of mobile phones is increasing at a very fast rate. And so mobile commerce is actually growing very fast. You know, most people, they don't have computers or access to Wi-Fi and all, but they do have phones and they have, uh, you know, uh, competitively priced 3G connections. So they're shopping on their phones. So there is a huge opportunity in India, but India is a difficult market because it's very mm. price sensitive. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, the return rate is pretty high and sometimes you'll get returns because, uh, you know, the address couldn't be found because it was in a far flung place somewhere <laughs> mm. um, or, you know, for all kinds of reasons. However, there's, uh, it is a huge opportunity for certain kinds of products and, um, you know, like um, health supplements and health related products. That's a very fast growing industry currently. And there are a couple of ways to start selling into India. So first of all, to sell on Amazon India, you need an Indian company. And um, to have an Indian company, you need uh, an Indian partner. So you need a local to be a director in the company and can be a very mi min minority shareholder, like even, you know, just 1% is fine. But there are services um, that, that will help foreigners set up companies so it's everything is done online all you need to do is just tell them hey i want to set up a company in india and they will even um give you a you know a local director for a fee mm. so they'll they'll do everything for you there are a lot of you know there there's some certifications and clearances that need to be uh done from the from various banks and also they'll do everything for you for a fee and they'll help set you up set the company up so that's one option if you want to go all in and if you know that your product uh, you know, will, will do well. Another option is to partner with somebody in India who's already selling on Amazon and use them as your distributor. So um, you know, if you have a brand, for example, that you're selling in another market, then um, try to look for an Amazon seller in India who has an account and uh, you know, uh, is already selling there. And then ship some some of your products to them and ask them to you know sell your products as as your distributor, um, and that will allow you to test the market and see what kind of response you get. And if you think there is demand for that product, then you can you know go all out and and establish your own company there. That's true. True. Step by step, I think is is always a smarter way. There's a yeah for Chinese, sure. <laughs> Chinese saying is. Uh, feel the stones as you cross the river don't like jump in but slowly one foot on the mm -hmm. rock in the river across the river next rock so it's uh try to put some fun stuff in here but this has been really insightful megan thank you i'm glad we finally get you on the show we've been talking to each other for quite some time and is, let's get into some of the fun stuff here exciting uh latest developments the there's a lot of stuff happening, amazing stuff in October. We'll talk about some other things, but let's first focus on the sourcing trip. You know, you have your first first one, and I'm sure listeners, if they enjoyed what they heard, if they want to 
dive in and, you know, the best is to go there, right? So what do you, what do you got lined up for us? Absolutely. So I am so excited about this trip. I've actually been working on it for the last six months and I even traveled to India to the fair, um, you know, and talked to the fair organizer and exhibitors and service providers. And I even wrote a book about sourcing from India because I realized that there wasn't a lot of information available about sourcing from India. You know, for China, there's so many blogs and YouTube uh, channels and everything, but there's nothing for India. So I, I thought that there was a gap. So the India sourcing trip is a learning plus sourcing plus cultural guided trip that is um, organized around the Indian Handicrafts and Gifts Fair in Delhi. So this is one of the uh, major export fairs that are held in India. Um, it's, uh, the main categories at the fair are you know, home decor, furnishings, um, leather products, wooden products, um, all of the key categories that uh, India specializes in and that would be of interest to e-commerce sellers. There are about 3,000 exhibitors at the fair. And the best thing that I like about the exhibitors there is that everyone is export focused. So you'll find that the products are, uh, you know, the designs and the types of products available there are based on the design preferences of U.S. and European customers. So they're not, you know, like the local kind of designs. And um, so this is a seven-day trip. And um, apart from visiting the fair, we will also have presentations to teach people uh, about sourcing from India. So it's basically a crash course that will allow you to source any product from India at a later stage, not only products that are available at the fair. Um, so the way the trip is structured is that um, attendees will arrive in India or arrive in India on October 14th. Then on October 15th, we will have a full day of conferences uh, or presentations where we talk about things like um, what are the products that India specializes in, how to negotiate with suppliers, how to vet suppliers, um, you know, all of the different aspects that are related to uh, to sourcing. The next three days, we will. Uh, we will do guided tours of the trade show. So we'll, we'll take people there. We'll, we'll teach them how to uh, talk to suppliers, what uh, kinds of uh, information to ask suppliers, you know, how to document all of that information. And then in the afternoons, we will, um, after attending the show, we'll have more presentations and masterminds. Uh, and then in the evenings, we'll have dinners and networking, and we'll invite various experts to attend uh, the dinners with us as well. And then um, we're also going to be visiting a factory. So I think it's really important for people to, you know, get a close understanding of how manufacturing uh, happens in India. So we'll visit a factory near Delhi. And then we're going to um, also do a cultural program. So on one of the nights, uh, we've booked this ballroom in a hotel for our group. And uh, we've got a stage and lighting and a dance performance exclusively mm -hmm. for the group by this Indian troupe. So, you know, some cultural immersion and cultural experience as well. Nice. There you go. And then we're going to go to the Taj Mahal for a day. So Taj Mahal is about three hours from Delhi by road. And um, it's one of the seven wonders of the world. So we're going to spend uh, a full day uh, traveling to Taj Mahal. And then um, on the last day of the trip, which is October 20th, uh, we'll have some presentations in the morning talking about brand building and, you know, what the next steps are. And um, yeah, a few, uh, you know, one more mastermind and then um, that's, that's the end of the trip. So I've got uh, quite a few coaches, uh, India sourcing experts and e-commerce coaches who are going to be joining the trip. So there are a few people from Australia. There's just one couple who've been sourcing products from India for about one and a half years now. And they're doing $100,000 in profit only for their, from their India products. And they have stopped sourcing products from China altogether. They did about eight products from China, but they found that uh, the products were too competitive and they were not profitable. And now they're really successful with these India products. Then I've got uh, Chris Thomas from Australia, who's, uh, who's been into e-commerce for a long time and a yeah. uh, very successful seller as well. CJ Rosenbaum from the U.S., He's joining the trip as well. Great. And then I've got quite a few sourcing agents who have a lot of experience, um, you know, in, in sourcing from India. And they're going to be giving presentations on various aspects related to sourcing. And then we've also got a logistics service provider 
um, that understands e-commerce. There are a couple of Americans who live in India who are going to be joining the trip and they, they are into sourcing. And there's this one person who actually is an Amazon seller himself and he sells products uh, from India, uh, you know, on Amazon and he's quite successful. So he'll be there too. And then I've also got a manufacturer who's going to come and talk about um, all of the apparel manufacturing in India and, you know, kind of give an overview of that. So, yeah, I mean, trying to give people a lot of information and knowledge and connections and, um, you know, tips and advice that will allow them to source any product from India, not only the ones that are available at the show. Exciting. Yeah. We can feel, I, I think listeners can feel your energy. I definitely can. It's, <laughs> it's exciting. And yeah, the world is, the world is changing and yeah, well, I really support your uh, entrepreneurial, you know, endeavors and a lot of listeners do as well. And then we mentioned uh, Global Sources Summit is also happening later in October and that'll be, you've been doing that for a few years and it's, it's been great. Um, as well in Hong Kong, right? And yeah, absolutely. So Global Sources Summit will be from 27th to the 29th of October. And I think your cross-border summit is right before that, right? Yeah, 22nd really, to the 23rd, I think. Exactly, right in between yeah. all these. If somebody could be really super somehow and go to all three, that would be <laughs> like intense. Yeah. But yeah, they'll all be happening Luckily, there's, we always try not to have over, overlap, but yeah, I mean, yes. lots, <laughs> lots of opportunity for people in these these uh, trade show seasons. So it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. It's really amazing. And uh, yeah, we're getting deep into the show. It's gone well into our normal recording time. And I think it's been very uh, insightful and exciting. I think, I think, Listeners, hopefully, you know, I think a lot of people learn, but also just taking action, you know, tr trying some things out and, you know, October's coming up quick. It's just a few months away. So people should make their plans. And, and so how can they find out more information? Megala, you, where can people go to uh, find out about this amazing opportunity? Yeah, so they can reach out to me on Facebook. That's the easiest, um, you know, just search for me on Facebook um, and send me a message. Or you can also send an email to info at indiasourcingtrip.com. That's okay. the email address. Great. Okay. Thanks so much. As we covered quite a bit. I think we covered everything. Is unless there's something else you'd like to add? No, I think uh, we covered everything. So um, I just want to thank you, Michael. Uh, this was, um, you know, for, for giving me the opportunity to come on your podcast. So, yeah, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, my pleasure. This this what it's about is is uh, helping everybody and building a stronger community between all these great uh, people. So thanks, Megla. Absolutely, thanks, Mike. Can you believe October trade show season is already coming up so quick? We are talking about on the show. There's India sourcing trip. There's many other trade shows, but I hope you can make some time to come to our cross border summit, fourth annual in Guangzhou this time, October 22nd and 23rd of 2019. Maybe you're listening to this show in the future, Ooh, which is pretty cool. But if you're listening to it now, at least before October 2019, it would be amazing to meet uh, amazing speakers. And of course, I will be there and amazing guests from our show over the years have come out to support and share their amazing knowledge. We're working harder than ever to make it as valuable as possible, bringing in some big guns and others, talking about import and export, mostly export. That's our sweet spot here at Global From Asia. I hope to see you there, www.crossbordersummit.com. If you want to slip into slash China, as we have more places around the world in the works. Thank you, Megala. It's great to get you on the show finally. Appreciate uh, you sharing and giving us all this knowledge and insights. And the India sourcing trip looks amazing. So I, I'm sure those that want to venture out there will get a ton of value. I think that's, you know, while we can sit behind our computers or have our earbuds on with these podcasts, I think you got to get out there and meet people and see things. You know, I think sourcing on uh, online and chatting in chats is only going to get you so far until you actually meet these people and shake hands and speak in Indian English or American English or 
the real English, English, American, uh, British English. It's whatever you want to call it. Whatever language, I think making that physical eyeball to eyeball contact will always be the main way to build a relationship. But I hope you and I have been getting to know each other. If you've been listening for a while and you're in your car or in your bicycle, walking your dog or sitting in your office bored out of your mind. Another crazy one. Um, it's a weird feeling, but I mean, it's been over 10 years since I quit my job in Wall Street, but seems like that office is maybe going to close. I worked at 60 Wall, it's a Deutsche Bank building. I'm reading these articles. I talked about them on Mike's blog.com site, uh, but they might be, re- well, they are restructuring and laying off a lot of their U.S. operations. Deutsche Bank means Bank of Germany or German Bank. They're uh, going through a huge issue. I don't even follow the news too much, but I did see the headline Deutsche Bank laying off in the U.S. That could have been me. Maybe if I didn't meet you and your earbuds and become some podcaster, traveler, whatever, dude. Um, I'd be sitting behind my desk on Wall Street. Maybe I'd be getting the, the pink slip, but they're probably they're going to get a decent severance package. I don't feel too bad for my colleagues at Deutsche Bank. I'm sure they're getting a few months or years of severance. Who knows how much? But anyway... But that's why you guys are awesome. You're listening and you're learning and you're taking action. I hope you're taking action. Of course, you can listen and learn and accumulate all kinds of knowledge about India sourcing, China sourcing, Thailand sourcing, blah, 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 blah. But if you're not actually doing anything with it, you might as well just sit back and relax and tune out of this show. But I want to share about some of my crazy experiences buying from India on my last bar products business and I came out to China and I thought everything was in China, right? I think a lot of us, but I, I led, I led myself to India for many of my stainless steel bar supplies and I found a supplier. I've still never been to India. It's on my list. I have Indian friends, uh, American in, not native Americans, Indian Indians in India that would go to study abroad in America or they would probably actually, um, extreme here they're more american born indian non-native american indian indians but uh basically they i hope i'm not offending anybody with that but it is pretty confusing but they um they helped me out a little bit i also had some of my college friends at hong kong help me out when i first moved over to china and hong kong i I uh, stayed at their house in Hong Kong when I first landed, and they helped me out a lot from college, you know, using your college network. I had a college network from Indians that helped me go to the factory for me, Uh, and they took photos of the products before they were shipped because I I had no idea what I was doing. I was talking to them on email. I found their website. I think it might have been Global Sources or others I had found, and I, you know, you just wire money to a company in another country especially when you're in the u.s they think you're crazy i don't know if they still think you're crazy but when i would go down to the bank my local bank and make a payment they're like you know this money can't come back and it's going to another country do you know these people you're sending this money to i'm like yeah i mean chat to them a little bit in email and skype call or skype chat so did that a couple of times but didn't get these photos yeah it looks good it's like a picture of cardboard boxes and well the physical products are in there and the products were good and but that's the hardest part i think we you know we can't set up offices everywhere and have people everywhere but i it seems like there's more and more services coming out in india we also have a member i want to give a shout out to sunan we should get him on the show he's a really strong in pakistan i think he also has operations in india and china for qc and he's helped me out with some payments to pakistan also we have some people on our team in pakistan which is a pretty amazing global world we live in now but back to india you know just i i probably wasted some logistics companies time i feel bad this is a hard part about b2b or sourcing yeah i went to these logistics companies in hong kong thinking Hey, I'm buying from India, I'm buying from China, I'm buying from Thailand. Literally, I bought from Thailand even before. Um, before, And I said, uh, can I send all this stuff to this Hong Kong warehouse and then you guys like bundle it, check it, assemble it? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. But like I said in the interview, that, that adds a lot of time and more importantly, money to your supply chain. 
I don't even think the big boys do it, but definitely if you're a small fry like I was, or maybe I still am, you know, I don't think it's worth it to send all of your stuff to... Hong Kong is kind of a free trade zone or an SAR. We've had shows, Chris Moore sharing about that before, a few weeks ago. Who knows how long it'll be a SAR. But, you know, it is a free trade zone with low or mostly no t import taxes to that region of the world. But there's also free trade zones in China. So the idea is maybe, hey, I could send some stuff from India, I could send some stuff from Thailand, send some stuff from here, put it in this free trade zone, bundle it all up, and ship it all around the world. I mean, actually, it's even like this show name, Global from Asia, you know. Keep your stock here. We're talking to some people, some people on our newsletter who want to actually warehouse some in Southeast Asia, buy from China, send over here, send over there. It is true. I mean, if you send it, to the Western world, the costs add up very quickly whenever anybody needs to touch that package, touch that pallet, that price gets a little bit more expensive. So, but I never did it. I never, I never really have still yet to buy from, say, India and send it to Hong Kong and take some China stuff, mix it together and ship it down to different parts of the world. But maybe you have. Maybe, maybe you should be on the show if you've done that. That would be pretty awesome. But most of the time, you're probably going to be sending it directly to your receiving country like I did and use a third party warehouse to receive all these places and then bundle it so I you know bar supplies we make some gift sets and other different kind of combinations of products and put them all together make them look all nice but yeah it was uh, it was always a headache supply chain if we all are saying it's so cool to buy from outside of China I think it, like she said like Megalith said some uh, people going to a trip in from Australia have bought all from India now. I think that would be the smarter thing is try to source or resource from all in one country. That is the biggest challenge. Even if the cost might be higher on certain products, your life will be so much simpler. Your logistics will be so much simpler. It burned me out. Honestly, I have to say my first e-commerce business, I got burnt out. I sold into a couple pieces. I wish I could get the Chinese side of the person that bought my business on this show, but he's a shadow like I am and doesn't want to come on. Might meet him in China soon again. But when I split up all my different stuff in my first business and sold it for pieces to different people in my network, I, uh, I was also burned out with this supply chain. It is really hard to buy from India, Thailand, and China, and also have US suppliers and Canadians. I bought from Canada too. I think there was one thing from Italy, but I don't think I was the, I was not the importer. I would buy it wholesale from a guy in the U.S. So many different SKUs with that last bar supplies business back in the day. Mm, some stuff in the works. We can talk about that in the future. The blah, blah, blah is almost up. I hope you guys enjoy. Also, we've been working really hard on making the membership more valuable for those that are really hardcore, amazing fans and supporters and want even more value. We're doing calls with private members. We have some amazing hot seat mastermind calls and I'm uh, I'm rebuilding the membership site. It got actually the site got hacked. I don't know if I told anybody on it. Some I think it's Russians got in and put credit card offer spam all throughout this site and uh, had to rebuild everything actually. There was this nightmares happened to me before. Luckily I have an amazing team. But the membership site is getting fixed and uh, it's going to be bigger and better. We put on a separate server. I try to put everything on one site. It's it's tricky for anybody that wants to do that. It's pretty hard to keep everything in one server. So we're splitting it up. VIP.globalfromasia.com And we are up. Thank you so much. My kids are swimming in a pool. I don't know if you can hear them, but I'm going to go join them. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. To get more info about running an international business, please visit our website at www.globalfromasia.com. That's www.globalfromasia.com. Also, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes feed. Thanks for tuning in.